Welcome to our sex second lecture covering chapter 13, which is the uh, kind of schizophrenic chapter that covers two uh, only somewhat related topics, those topics being contracts in writing and third party contracts. We're still on that first portion of the topic, so we're still in the writing requirements for contracts portion of the chapter as we uh, do this second lecture. You may recall when we were together in the first lecture, we talked about when the statute of frauds um, require a writing. We talked about contracts whose terms prevent possible performance within one year need to be in writing. We talked about marriages made in consideration of marriage prenuptial agreements, in other words, need to be in writing. We talked about contracts for one party to pay the debt of another if the initial party fails to pay. We talked about that needs to be in writing. These are that co-signing situation. And we talked about any contract relating to an interest in real property, land, in other words, that needs to be in writing. We also talked about how any contract for the sale of goods that totals more than $500 also has to be in writing. These are the five categories that we're putting under the umbrella of statute of frauds, even though this last one has to do with the UCC, um, requires a writing. There's a couple of others we have in Texas, but you're not responsible for those for the purposes of this class. So now that we've talked about when the statute of frauds applies, let's drill a little bit deeper. Let's talk about some exceptions to the statute of frauds, when the statute of frauds doesn't apply. And we're going to talk about um, four particular categories um, here, we're, uh, and the, the four situations in which, um, uh, and these would be situations in which usually the statute of frauds would apply to this fact pattern. But because of this uh, additional fact, it isn't going to apply. And we have the situation where an admission is made, where there's partial performance, promissory estoppel, or there's some other exception under the UCC. So let's drill down to each one of those topics. Um, imagine that um, I enter into a contract with Bob and I am supposed to buy some land from Bob. I have agreed to pay Bob $100,000 for this undeveloped uh, land out in the country. Let's say it's um, uh, uh, 200 acres. Um, Bob and I shake hands on it, but we don't put anything in writing. Um, it just so happens that a few days later, Bob gets a call from um, an oil company and they want to um, uh, drill on his land and that they expect that there is significant amount of oil reserves under that land. Well, Bob, of course, now regrets his decision to um, sell the land to me because he would like, because this is, this is going to dramatically increase the value of the land. So um, he calls me up and he goes, Groover, I've changed my mind. I am not willing to sell you the land anymore. I said, but Bob, we had an agreement. You promised me that you would sell this particular acreage, these 500, excuse me, uh, 200 acres for $100,000. Bob says, yeah, I know I said that, but I've changed my mind. And we never wrote it down. And the statute of frauds requires that these agreements be reduced to writing. I say to Bob, but Bob, you're an honorable man. How could you back out of your word? You know that, that you and I understood that this was a final deal between us. Bob says, ah, that's just the position I'm taking. I'm not going to sell the land to you. So I file a lawsuit against Bob. So it's Groover versus Bob. I sue Bob. We go to trial. Bob is called to the witness stand. My attorney says to Bob, Bob, isn't it true that on you know, May 14th, 2017, you t uh, agreed, you accepted Groover's offer to buy your land, uh, which totaled 200 acres for the price of $100,000. And Bob says, yes. Well, guess what? That's an admission. He is admitting in court under oath that he actually made that oral agreement. 
Well, the primary purpose of the statute of frauds is to prevent fraud, right? And so if a person is admitting, yep, I entered into the agreement, but it was oral, um, the courts are going to be uh, taking the position, well, I mean, if you're, if you're admitting to it, if you're conceding that, in fact, that agreement was reached, um, that an oral agreement was, was reached, uh, the, the courts aren't going to require that it be reduced into writing. Um, this is true because this, uh, I, I, in the first lecture I mentioned that even though this, the first version of the statute of frauds was developed in England in the 1600s, in England now there is no statute of frauds. And one of the reasons for that is that the statute of frauds was designed in part to reduce the chances of fraud. But the statute of frauds can actually be used to create a fraud. Let me give you an example of how you can use the statute of frauds as a weapon. Okay, so this time I own the land. And Louise, uh, I put up a sign saying, trying to sell this land. And I mentioned the price of, um, we'll say $100,000 for the land. Louise knocks on my door and says, hey, Groover, I understand you wanna sell this land. I say, yes, I do, Louise. Louise and I have known each other our whole lives. This is a small town. Um, so Louise says, well, you know, what's your price? So we negotiate the price. And Louise says, well, you know what? I'm expecting to come into some money in about six months. Um, I don't have the money to pay right now, but what I'd like to do is rent the land for these next six months. And then uh, when this money comes in, I've inherited some money, but it's having to go through probate. And I, the, the attorneys told me that I should, won't actually get access to it for about six months. But when I do get the money, then I'll be able to pay the $100,000. But for these, this next six months, I'd like to pay you $1,000 in rent to live on the land. Well, there's no buildings on this land. Uh, but I say, that sounds like a pretty good deal. So under these terms, I'll get $6,000 in rent and $100,000 for the land. So we shake hands on it, but we don't do any kind of writing. Uh, we were longtime friends. We know each other quite well. We both trust the other. We just don't see any reason to write this down. So again, two, three, four months go by. Five months go by. And then I get a call from the oil and gas company. The oil and gas company are willing to uh, sign my property up for an oil lease. And they're willing to pay me $200,000 um, to, to sign up my property. And I'll get 6% royalties. Um, for whatever they, they discover underneath the land. And I'll still be able to use the surface estate. And they're hoping to close on this transaction in about eight weeks. Well, that's too late for me because I'm supposed to sell the land to Louise in four weeks. Oh my gosh, I, I, I would earn so much more money with this um, oil and gas lease. I would earn $200,000 and I would still own the land. Um, so it, it seems that I, I really don't want to fulfill my, my obligation to Louise. A couple more weeks pass. I'm in a quandary about what to do. Louise stops by and says, hey, Groover, um, I just got my money from my, uh, my probate. Great Aunt Mabel, as you know, passed away a while ago, and she left me about $110,000. And so now I have the money to go ahead and and buy uh, your land. As you know, we just decided on a $100,000 price. And um, she says, you know, I'm, I'm just so excited about this new property. Um, I, I don't know if you've driven by recently, but you may have noticed that I've already started clearing the land. I have, in fact, um, put in a gravel driveway. I've cleared the land, getting ready to build um, my, my house, and in fact, I've poured a foundation. Um, I've uh, also uh, hired an architect to design the building, and um, I have put in a septic tank and um, done other improvements to the land. I say to, to Louise, Louise, you know, I drive by that land virtually every day. I've seen all the changes that have been happening as you do each changes. It looks great. 
um, really you've you've really done some neat things with the land and you've been such a prompt payer of your your uh, rent every month it's due the first of the month and every single month you pay it on the first sometimes you even pay it earlier and you haven't caused me any problems you haven't asked me to do any particular things to maintain the property it's just been so easy and I really do appreciate that Louise says, well, no problem. I'm just excited about getting this started. I didn't see any reason to wait uh, to build the house until uh, we, we were able to finish up these details. And so um, I, you know, we can close in two weeks. That was our initial decision. Or we can close even sooner if you want. And I say, close? W what do you mean? Louise says, well, you know, close the transaction, transfer title from you to to me as we 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 talked about about six months ago and I say oh Louise um, you're my tenant uh, you've been renting the land and you've been such a lovely uh, land uh, uh, tenant and uh, you know even the best tenant usually doesn't build on the land that's just such a generous gift on your part to start preparing the land even though you don't own it uh, Thank you so much for that gift of that development. Um, when, when, when you move out in a couple of weeks, I'll be able to continue that project and, and really do appreciate what you've done already. Louise looks at me now like I'm crazy. <laughs> what are you talking about, Groover? Um, I'm, I'm buying the land. I mean, you know, I, I didn't build this for you. I, I built this for me. And in two weeks, it will be my land, not your land. Yes, I've been renting for now, but um, it'll be mine going forward. Um, well, let's, um, and I say, well, Louise, that's not how I remember it. In fact, if I were in the courtroom under oath, I would deny that I ever agreed to sell this land to you for $100,000. So in other words, I'm willing to perjure myself. So Louise can't rely upon me making an admission at trial. If I'm willing to perjure myself, an admission isn't going to work. But Louise still has a little bit of hope because we have this partial performance situation. Now, there's a couple of different ways of looking at this transaction. We could look at it as one contract, that, that there was a contract for a lease, that was stage one of the contract. And then the second stage is the purchase. Well, if you look at it as that's the whole contract, lease, then transitioning to purchase, then Louise has partially performed under the terms of the contract by paying the rent for the first six months. So she could say that's partial performance. Now I could argue um, well, I mean, first of all, I can dispute the fact that there was even an agreement to, to um, uh, purchase the land. But aside from that, even if there was such an agreement, I could say, well, we had two separate agreements. We had the, um, the lease agreement, which was a separate arrangement, and then the purchase agreement, which was a separate arrangement. If they are two separate arrangements, uh, two separate contracts, then her uh, uh, satisfying the terms of the rental agreement would not be partial performance of the purchase agreement. So that would not necessarily help Louise, but the next category is likely to be helpful to her. And this is that promissory estoppel category. Um, let's look at promissory estoppel here. Whenever you see the term promissory estoppel, stop for a second and you'll see that there's two words hiding in promissory estoppel. The first word is the word promise and the second word is the word stop. So when a person makes a promise, he should realize that he stopped or stopped from denying it later on in many circumstances. Now, a promise is usually not enforceable if both parties haven't provided consideration. Let's just stop here and go back to our elements of contract law. In order to have a contract, we need those four elements. We need an agreement, consideration, contractual capacity and legal object. Consideration has to be provided by both parties, the offeror and the offeree. The offeror makes a promise to the offeree, but the offeree doesn't have to do anything, and that promise is not enforceable as a contract. 
but sometimes that promise will be enforceable as in a promissory estoppel situation. Not always, and it's really left to the discretion of the court whether that particular situation will qualify. Um, so the otherwise unenforceable aspect of the contract is because there's, there's not consideration for the other person, for the person who is receiving the promise. The pro Oops, sorry. Oops, I went too far. For the promise C. So what you have to prove is you have to prove, the promisee has to prove that he or she detrimentally and reasonably relied upon the contract. Well, that's what we have in this situation. Louise can show that she spent money, uh, spent sweat equity in actually um, developing her land. Um, she uh, got, uh, got the gravel. To, to build the uh, the driveway, she poured it, she smoothed it out, she cleared the land, cutting back shrubs and grasses and tree stumps and all that kind of stuff. She uh, got a foundation poured, she got a contract, um, or she uh, uh, had an architect develop a plan uh, for the building, she put in a septic tank, uh, she can show a significant amount of detrimental reliance. Plus, most of those, that detrimental reliance would have been very obvious to me, the promisor. As I drove by every single day, I could see, oh, Louise has put gravel in. Oh, Louise has cleared all the brush. And that should have put me on notice that she was relying to her detriment on the fact that I would fulfill my promise. Um, and that her behavior was reasonable under the circumstances because she knew that I was seeing this and she had reason, given our past dealings with each other, she had reason to think that I'm an honorable person who will fulfill my promise. So under these circumstances, I might be stuck. Even though, we do, even though I'm willing to perjure myself, um, I might be uh, stuck under a promissory estoppel theory and be required to fulfill my contractual obligation to actually close on the real estate transaction. So we've covered situations of admission. We've covered situations of partial performance. We've covered promissory estoppel. Now let's talk about some exceptions under the UCC. Obviously, these exceptions would apply only when it is a contract for the sale of goods over $500, not for any of the other categories of transactions. So let's look at those. Um, okay, so when you have a contract between merchants, so for example, when Walmart and Toro enter into a contract where Toro agrees to provide or to sell a certain number of uh, lawnmowers to Walmart, well, that's a transaction between merchants. Toro is a merchant in the selling of lawnmowers, and uh, Walmart is a merchant in the um, retail sale of lawnmowers. And so they're both merchants. So oral contracts between two merchants don't have to be in writing. But let's imagine that Toro uh, had some storefronts of its own, maybe it does, I don't know, and it sold directly to consumers. Well, then that would be an, a contract between Toro, a merchant, and a consumer, a non-merchant, just an ordinary homeowner or renter or something like that. Well, those contracts, if the lawnmower is over $500, uh, has to still be in writing. Another category uh, that require uh, under the UCC that is an exception to the $500 uh, uh, item price would be uh, customized goods. An example here would be uh, embroidered goods or uh, goods that are manufactured to meet the particular specifications of a particular customer. You can see that if uh, Daniela is buying you know, a lot of towels, $500, $501 worth of towels. Um, it's going to be hard for that retailer to find somebody else who wants pink and green towels with Daniela on. I mean, there's Daniela's not the most common name out there, and so it would be hard to find somebody under those circumstances. Now, if the towels were, had been left plain, uh, just pink towels, then it probably wouldn't be that hard for the seller to find somebody who wanted to have pink towels. But once they've been customized, um, then th that contract will be enforceable even if the value is over $500. So those are two examples of exceptions under the UCC. So we've covered four categories of situations in which even though the statute of frauds would usually require that there be a writing, 
the law has made an exception. So again, this is an example of a list, so you're going to want to keep a record of this and make sure that when you are studying that you have these four exceptions in mind. Now we're going to talk about some tips about contract writing. Um, one of the things that surprised me when I was growing up was um, the way contracts were developed. Uh, my father, uh, by degree, is a chemical engineer, and he uh, ultimately kind of moved out of the chemical engineering business and got into designing power plants in um, many countries around the world. And he would negotiate contracts involving millions and millions of dollars, um, working with lots of different uh, countries companies and countries and he worked for a large uh, company as well and um, he had no formal legal training he had not gone to law school he had dealt in his professional life many times with attorneys but he oftentimes would be the main negotiator and he wrote a lot of the language of these contracts um, when I was in high school, he was actually involved in a lot of these negotiations, and I was very surprised. I had assumed this was something that only attorneys did. But in fact, in most con contract situations, it's not attorneys who are drafting the contract language. It's the business people. That's even true in large corporations like the one my father worked for. Um, I worked for JCPenney for 17 years, and the vast majority of contracts that JCPenney enters into the attorneys don't negotiate it. In fact, um, it has to be several million dollars before an attorney will even look at the contract to review it before it is signed. And so uh, when I go through these tips about how to write a contract, don't think to yourself, oh, I don't have to worry about that. Whenever I negotiate with somebody, we'll, we'll pass it on over to the legal department and they'll be the ones that will dot the I's and cross the T's. Well, you, you might have that experience. Certainly there are attorneys who do that kind of stuff. I don't want to make it sound like that doesn't happen. But don't be surprised if you find in your particular organization that you will be bearing a, uh, the, 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 the responsibility for at least some of the, uh, certainly the negotiation, uh, but also some of the drafting. So here's some things to keep in mind, even as a non-legal professional. Um, so when you are writing, this would of course apply to contract writing, but really any writing, is you ought to think through what am I trying to accomplish through this? What are my goals? At the end of the day, how will I be able to measure my success or my lack of success? What are the things that I am being evaluated on by my boss? Or if I'm an entrepreneur, how will I evaluate my success or lack of success? It's good to be explicit about this. Am I trying to uh, transfer risk uh, if something goes awry in this transaction to somebody else? Am I trying to maximize my potential profit, uh, but I'm willing to accept maybe a greater portion of the risk? Um, am I looking at a steady long-term uh, long uh, uh, profit or income stream, or um, am I more interested in a quick hit that uh, may not bear fruit over the long haul? There's lots of different uh, business goals that one can have, and one needs to think through it and make sure that whatever your goal is for this particular transaction at this particular time, you're advancing those goals, whatever they might be. Then you also ought to think about, what's my strategy for the writing? Um, how am I going to organize the material? And this, it can be very helpful to have a model to work from or to have some kind of checklist. And this might be a good area to talk with um, if you have a legal department in your organization, they may be able to provide you with a, a checklist of things you ought to include, things like a merger clause or um, things along those lines to make sure that you're dotting every I and crossing every T. Um, but things to think about uh, are, well, what is gonna happen if, if uh, somebody breaches? Uh, what kind of liquidated damages provision ought we have? Um, what, how will payment occur? When will payment occur? All of those things. And so you want to think through how to organize things. Chronological organization makes a lot of sense. Um, that can be one thing, but you might also want to think about things in terms of their importance. Maybe putting the most important stuff up front, 
or perhaps uh, thinking in terms of what are the controversial portions. You may want to start with the easy stuff, uh, build some consensus uh, between you and your, your negotiating partner, and then once you have some things you've agreed upon, move on to the more tricky things. Whenever you're writing, of course, you're going to want to avoid ambiguity. Ambiguity is dangerous. As soon as you have something that isn't crystal clear, it opens the possibility of the other side putting a different spin on it. Um, and this oftentimes doesn't happen at the time. And when we talked about the, the peerless case where the two parties, Rickles, I mean, um, Raffles and Rickles House had two different interpretations of which peerless boat it was. Was it the October peerless or was it the December peerless? And when they were meeting, even that time together, they both had a, a different understanding. But many times the ambiguity doesn't arrive until later. A, a part, a, one of the parties starts finding it convenient to see ambiguity. Maybe it's you, maybe it's the other guy. But at that moment, they see a reason. Oh, you know what? It would be convenient for me if we apply this other meaning to this word. And so you, it's not necessarily that the parties at the time they entered in the contract had uh, a different understanding about the about the meeting, but uh, over time, they, they realize that they have an advantage or an incentive to interpret the language differently. And so you have to be able to anticipate those things. Let me give you an example. I do this in class most time, and I will ask people uh, for a definition of this word. And the word is child. And I will ask people around the room to define what a child is. And I usually get answers like somebody under the age of 18. Uh, somebody who is too young to vote, somebody who is school-aged or preschool, uh, words like that. Usually people will define child to be somebody in their minority. And that's a perfectly good definition of child. I'm not going to debate that that's not a good definition of child because it is. But there's another meaning with child that we are all familiar with. But most of the time people don't volunteer this or at least it's not as commonly volunteered as the other. And that is the fact that I am the child of my parents. And yet, I am over the age of 18, by just a few years. And my guess is everybody who is watching this program is also the child of his or her parents, and yet you also have had your 18th birthday. So, the ordinary definition we have of child being somebody who is not an adult doesn't necessarily, that's not the only meaning of the word child. So you have to think through each word carefully, not just what's the most common use of that term, but what could be another meaning of the, of the term. For example, let's say we had a contract that said, uh, Bob is the child of uh, Teresa. Um, uh, as as long as Bob is the child, he is entitled to an income of a thousand dollars a month under the terms of this contract. Well, that can mean one of two things. It can mean up until the time that Bob turns eighteen, he's entitled to one thousand dollars a month, or it can mean that as long as he remains the legal child of Teresa. Uh, since he will be the legal child of Teresa until his death, um, even after Teresa has passed away, Bob then could be entitled to $1,000 a month until Bob dies at age 99. And so you can see by not defining what we meant by child, we have created a huge uh, ambiguity under the terms. Another thing to keep in mind is use active voice instead of passive voice. Um, hopefully in your English composition classes you have learned or are in the process of learning the differences between active voice and passive voice. If you haven't had the opportunity to do so, I would encourage you to ask your teacher for some assistance in getting those terms in, in your head and so you can be familiar with it. Uh, they can make a big, big difference in your contract writing in the clarity and the removal of ambiguity. Uh, let me just give you an example of an active voice sentence and a passive voice sentence. Here we have Bob killed Larry. This is an active voice sentence. 
you can see our sentence begins with our subject, Bob, and he is doing the verb, killed. And Larry is receiving the action of being killed. He's the direct object. This is active voice. But we could rewrite this to be passive voice. And we could say Larry was killed by Bob. And this would be in passive voice. We can see that Larry is in the subject position of the sentence at the beginning. But he's not doing any action. He's receiving the action of being killed. So when our subject receives the action but doesn't do the action, he, even though he's in the subject position, that's passive voice. Not all senses that are in passive voice have a by clause. We could have ended the sentence by Larry was killed. A lot of times passive voice is used when we don't know who did a particular action. But in this case, we do know who did it, Bob. And so when we have this by clause, this tells us the object of the by is a preposition. The object or the, the, um, the noun or pronoun that comes after the by uh, is doing the action of killing. But we can see in this sentence, especially if we ended with a period here, that we don't really know who did this action. And so therefore, passive is much less precise. Let's say this was instead, um, Bob must, or let's say Bob will buy, or Bob will pay um, $1,000 to Larry and we were to so that's active voice so it's clear who's supposed to pay the money and who's supposed to receive it but if we put it in passive voice we would say Larry uh, will be paid $1,000 well we can see who's supposed to receive it but we don't know who's going to pay it it's not clear whether it's Bob or Santa Claus or somebody else who's going to pay it and so by putting it in passive voice we have made it less precise. We have added ambiguity. So you want to have this type of sentence. So you want to start with the doer of the verb, then go to the verb, and then talk about who is being acted upon by a verb. Uh, again, this, this is just a very brief introduction to active voice and passive voice. If this is something that you have questions about, please come see me during my office hours. I'll be delighted to talk to you about this at great length. And again, if you are taking a, um, a English composition course, your English teacher will also be in an excellent position to assist you with a better understanding about this. Because this isn't a grammar course, I'm not going to be giving you test questions that require you to distinguish active voice from passive voice. Finally, I want to have a clear layout, and one of the big ways that we do this in legal writing is by having titles, uh, sections where we, we mark things off. In fact, typically each paragraph in a uh, contract will have a, a name. So the merger clause will be labeled merger clause. Um, the consideration clause might be cons called the consideration clause. Um, the uh, time to pay rent might be having the time to pay rent clause. Um, most of the time you're going to want to make it as simple as possible for the parties to find it. In very large contracts you might even have a table of contents so a person can easily flip to the particular section. You know contracts aren't like murder mystery novels. Uh, people don't read them from page one to page 400. They skip around. They read the portions that they need. So if I am responsible for administering a contract, going back to the janitorial contract that I entered into in the big office project. Well, I'm going to have supervisors who actually make sure that we're doing all the tasks we need to do. Let's say the contract says we're supposed to empty the trash cans every night, but we're only supposed to vacuum twice a week and dust once a week. Well, then you're going to want the supervisors not to vacuum every night um, and only empty the trash cans twice a week that would not be in compliance with the terms of the contract. So they need to be able to find those sections of the contract that they need to know about. But the supervisor, the person who is supervising the people who are actually janitors, 
doesn't need to know about the merger clause, doesn't need to know about how payment is being handled. That's not their area of responsibility. So the, the, it might be a contract that's 100 pages long, but the portion that they are focused on might just be one or two pages long. And so by having a clear layout of the contract, it'll be easy for those parties to find the particular information they need. And there might be, you know, 100 different people, each person needing kind of their own section of the contract. The easier you make it for parties to find what they need, the more likely it is that people are going to comply with the terms of the contract. And that's a win-win for everybody. Both parties benefit when, it make, when the parties make it super easy for the parties to, to comply. Let's talk about sufficiency of the writing under the statute of frauds. You know, we've talked about the statute of frauds. We've talked about when we need a writing, but we haven't really talked about what is required when we talk about the writing. I mean, does the writing have to be a 100-page contract or can something a lot simpler satisfy? Well, let's go back to our statute here. Okay, so remember before we talked about Section B, we talked about the various types of contracts that are covered by the statute of frauds, but we didn't talk about Section A. Well, now we're going to talk about Section A. This is Sorry about that. Here we go. This is the section that talks about what is what type of writing is required in Texas. Let's go ahead and read it. A promise or agreement described in subsection B, that's down here, that's the part we talked about in the first lecture. A promise or agreement described in subsection B of this section is not enforceable unless the promise or agreement or a memorandum of it is in writing and signed by the person to be charged with the promise or agreement or by someone lawfully authorized to sign for him. So we have two requirements. It has to be in writing and it has to be signed by the defendant. If, I, if I'm suing to enforce the contract, it doesn't matter whether I signed it or not. What's important is that you, the person I'm suing, signed it. Now, our statute in Texas perhaps is not written as tightly as you might want because all we say it has to be in writing. But there's actually a, quite a bit of case law in Texas and elsewhere that puts a lot more clarity into what we mean by in writing. So let's go back and look at what our textbook says is involved here. Typically, you're going to need five things in order to satisfy the writing requirement for the statute of frauds. It's not burdensome, though. You definitely don't need a 100-page contract to satisfy it. Well, first of all, you have to identify the parties to the contract. Uh, in other words, you know, if I'm entering into a contract with Bob, I have to say, you know, Bob. Do I have to list, let's say his full name is Robert Herbert uh, Brown the Fourth? Do I have to list all of those parts of his name? Probably not if under the circumstances it's pretty obvious, I mean Bob, right? Um, now, if there are tons of Bobs that I was interacting with, then it might make sense to say Bob Brown. Or if I also interact professionally with Bob Brown and Bob Brown's dad, Robert Herbert Brown III, then it might be beneficial to identify whether we're talking about the fourth or the third. So the identification of the parties doesn't have to be uh, their you know, birth certificate name, but that does have to be sufficient that it's obvious under the circumstances. In some cases, it could even be a nickname like Bob. Actually, Bob's legal name is Robert, but it's a nickname. Or it could be if someone goes by the name Curly or Carrot Top or something along those, those lines, um, if that's a name that they're generally known by, and that's how the, the uh, person is identified, even that under certain circumstances can be satisfactory. Then we need the subject of the agreement. Again, we don't need to have to necessarily have the nitty gritty details, but we need these to identify what we're talking about. The 200 acres that I own on Smith Street uh, between the, the Smith land and the Jones's land. That's not the legal definition that you find on a plat, but it probably sufficiently identifies it for the purposes of, of the statute of frauds. The consideration, if any, is given, and of course we do need consideration in a contract. So what am I providing? Well, I'm giving up the land and, and uh, 
Louise is giving me $100,000. So we'd want to list what the consideration is. Any part in terms of the contract, and also it must be signed. The statute of frauds can be a single page or a single document, it can be on the back of an envelope, or it can be several different documents connected to each other. Um, it could be on the back of an envelope, an email message, um, a receipt, all different kinds of pieces of the puzzle uh, to get to having all of these elements in one document. The document itself has to be signed, so we're going to talk a little bit more about this one. A little bit more detail. has to be signed, but the signature doesn't have, you know, typically signature is going to be at the end of a contract. It doesn't have to be, though, at the end um, of the contract. So, again, there's more flexibility here than you might or otherwise think. It doesn't have to be the full signature. It could be initials. It could be just a mark. Let's say my arm is broken and I can't do my full signature. Or let's say I'm illiterate and I can't write my name. Or I've got a severe arthritis or something along those lines. If I make my mark and it's intended to function as a signature, then it is going to be a signature. Again, um, if only one person signs it, the person who um, the person who signed it is the person who can be sued, who can be the defendant. When the plaintiff signs, but the defendant doesn't sign, the plaintiff is going to be out of luck if he or she is relying upon the statute of frauds. Let's talk about the sufficiency of the writing of the UCC. The UCC is actually less demanding than the statute of frauds is under this area. For one thing, the UCC doesn't require that the parties actually be named in the agreement. Um, so that's not necessary. Uh, the UCC does require that the quantity of the items being sold be listed. And again, the UCC permits a lot of different documents to constitute a writing. Faxes, emails, invoices, and this is very common, bills of lading, very common, sales slips, checks. Uh, some combination of these things can also satisfy the requirement. And this is this next one is perhaps the most surprising. Okay, you can use oral testimony to establish the existence of a writing that would satisfy um, the statute of frauds, but maybe that writing has been destroyed or misplaced. So you, you're saying you're providing oral testimony. This, so we'll say this invoice was developed, I saw it, or I prepared it, I know it, it exists, and I'm going to testify orally about it, but I'm not producing it. Well, that can still prove up the existence of that invoice, and it would be a sufficient, quote-unquote, writing for the UCC. A little crazy exception there, isn't it? Well, we are done now with our second lecture topic. So during this presentation, we've talked about Let's just do a little refresher before we end. Um, we've talked about the exceptions to the use to the uh, statute of frauds. We talked about uh, when the defendant admits the existence of the oral contract, when the plaintiff partially performs under the terms of the oral contract, when the uh, plaintiff has detrimentally relied on the uh, promise of the defendant, the court may enforce the contract. When the um, oral contract involves at least one non-merchant, the, uh, the UCC does require a writing, but when it's between two merchants, the UCC does not require a writing. If the contract, oral contract is for customizable goods or customized goods, then the writing is not required. Then we discussed uh, various writing tips, and we discussed the types of writing that are required to satisfy the statute of frauds. And finally, we talked about the types of writings that are required to satisfy the UCC writing requirement. This concludes our second lecture in our series on Chapter 13. Um, if you have questions, as always, please feel free to email me, come by my office hours, or raise those questions during class. It's been a pleasure talking with you today. I hope you have a great day. Thanks for your attention.